Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for making it here through the snow and sleet. Uh, you will be quote unquote rewarded uh, with, with a, a, a cool little puzzle that um, has um, both, both recreational value um, as well as um, a deep connection to the most popular sorting algorithm, or at least the most commonly used sorting algorithm called quicksort. And so what we have up here uh, is uh, what I call the disorganized handyman puzzle. I, this is not a puzzle of my invention, but I called it this uh, because uh, I think at some point when I read this, uh, it was a carpenter who uh, had uh, a, a bunch of uh, nuts and bolts uh, in his bag, and uh, they were all mixed up. So, so rather than having uh, these uh, the, uh, the nuts uh, attached to the bolts, uh, he was disorganized, and uh, the nuts and bolts were separate, uh, and then they all got mixed up together in a bag. Okay. Now, obviously, all puzzles are a little bit contrived. And so we're going to assume here that there's a, a hundred different nuts and a hundred associated bolts, and these 200 objects are all mixed up into this uh, one bag that the carpenter is carrying. And uh, not only that, um, each of the bolts is unique in terms of its size. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, there is an associated nut associated with uh, each, each unique bolt. Um, and so, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the goal of this puzzle is going to be finding the most efficient way of uh, creating some organization in this bag by uh, attaching uh, each nut to the corresponding bolt or vice versa, right? And you can assume uh, that there's no ambiguity uh, because of the uniqueness of the nuts and the bolts. And uh, there's 100 pairs waiting to be discovered. Um, and you can uh, try to make that process as uh, efficient as possible. As with all of the puzzles that we look at here, uh, there's going to be a naive slash straightforward way of doing this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, figure that out uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we're going to um, uh, analyze the complexity of that, or how long it takes for a specific example of 100 nuts and 100 bolts. And then we're going to scratch our heads and try and do better. All right? Uh, and as I mentioned, obviously, there's going to be some programming associated with this. And uh, we're not going to represent uh, you know, nuts uh, and bolts in, uh, in, in, in programs or, or codes. We're going to switch gears and, and talk about sorting uh, once we're done with this puzzle. Um, good. Uh, the only way uh, that you or the carpenter, if you're the carpenter's helper, have of checking uh, to see that a nut attaches to a bolt is to try it out. Okay, And the nuts and bolts are different enough in size that even if you had your eyes closed or it was a dark room, uh, you could, uh, if, if the nut attaches to the bolt, it would screw on uh, perfectly. Um, if, it is, uh, if the bolt is smaller than the nut, it would just go through, and uh, it would be obvious uh, that uh, the bolt is smaller than the nut. And if the nut is smaller than the bolt, it would also be obvious, because the bolt you know, wouldn't go through it, right? which makes perfect sense from a physical standpoint. right? We've all tried this before. Um, we've had, maybe not all of you, but I've certainly had occasion to, uh, uh, to, to discover pairs of uh, uh, of nuts and bolts, though it was never you know, 100 of them. right? Uh, but so that's kind of a little bit contrived, as I said. Um, all right, good. So um, the setup is clear. We're good on the setup. Excellent. Uh, so what is the straightforward way of doing this? Someone? Yeah, Fadi, back there. So maybe like uh, choose a nut uh, on random and try every different bolt and go. Right. We could choose a nut at random, try every different bolt, or choose a bolt at random and try um, every different nut, right? And uh, we're guaranteed, uh, in this case, that uh, there is a pairing. And so after we do that, uh, we can put this paired nut and bolt aside. And uh, we've shrunk the problem down uh, to uh, one less than the original problem. If I started out with 100 
uh, pairs uh, that are not paired together, but there's 100 nuts and 100 bolts, then I get one pair, which is a correct pair, and I have 99 nuts left and 99 bolts left, right? And I keep going, right? Perfectly reasonable way of doing things. And um, I, let, me, let me show you how uh, that would work. Um, these slides were make, made by my daughters many years ago, you know, back when they listened to me, right? Uh, I have fat chance of getting them to do any work for me anymore. Uh, but they are busier than they were, I guess, uh, years ago. Uh, at least they pretend to be. Um, and uh, there you go. Uh, you uh, end up uh, in this uh, particular example, which obviously has uh, many fewer than uh, 100 nuts and bolts. Uh, you end up um, uh, checking this. And in the worst case, um, how many comparisons would I had to do? Would I, would I have had to do if I had 100 uh, nuts and 100 bolts? In the worst case, I would have to. I have to do all 100 because uh, I might just have gotten unlucky. Like, like I said, I mean we're not eyeballing this at all. I, uh, you, uh, you could probably uh, prune the search a little bit uh, with respect to um, putting aside not having to do an exact comparison. But let's just say that even looking at a nut, uh, in, as opposed to even touching it with the bolt that you've chosen, uh, is in fact a comparison. You know, you're just eyeballing it as opposed to physically touching the bolt and nut together, and we're going to call that a comparison. And if you do that, and if you make that uh, assumption, then obviously uh, you're going to have to look at uh, all 100 uh, nuts if you have a random bolt in the worst case. Okay? You might get lucky. On an average, it might be only 50. Uh, we're not going to do that type of analysis here. Um, so, so that's good. Um, and uh, uh, what is the complexity uh, in terms of the growth rate um, of this, uh, this particular algorithm? Um, if I had n nuts and bolts, then I do n comparisons in the worst case. Um, to find the first pair. And when I say first pair, I mean the correct pairing that's associated with the nut and the bolt. And uh, you know what happens? Yeah, Kevin, you have a question? Wouldn't it be less than n squared? Because once you find each pair, you have one less. That's pair. exactly right. It's, uh, it's absolutely less than n squared in, um, uh, in, in, in terms of numerics. Um, the, the growth rate uh, is uh, uh, a slightly different question, right? Um, it's related, obviously. And so um, I, if you uh, do this and you get the first pair, uh, you now have a problem that, ha that is of size n minus 1, right? And so in this case, how many comparisons am I going to make when I have n minus 1 nuts and n minus 1 bolts? In the worst case, I'm going to do n minus 1 uh, comparisons, right? Um, and then I keep going down, and, and uh, I, you, you, could, you could argue that um, at, the, at the very end, um, when I have two nuts and two bolts, um, one comparison, if I assume that uh, this was a perfect uh, 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 set of uh, nuts and bolts that we had all pairs uh, right at the beginning, uh, you, you could argue that that, uh, that small problem corresponding to two nuts and bolts can be solved using one comparison. Um, and uh, you immediately know uh, uh, which uh, nut pairs with which bolt and uh, the other one as well. Uh, but you know, let's call it a confirmation comparison and essentially say you need two comparisons here um, and, and one here. Uh, you can obviously uh, uh, shave a number uh, a little bit out of, out of, out of this. Um, but um, this goes back to, um, Kevin is right, it's less than n square if you look at it numerically. But the growth rate is n square. Because uh, we know that n plus n minus 1 plus n minus 2, da da da, 2 plus 1 is uh, n times n plus 1 divided by 2. And sure, you could, uh, you could take this one off. And uh, this would become n times n minus 1 big, uh, divided by 2. But uh, that growth rate um, is n squared. Grows as n squared. Right? So if you had 100 nuts and 100 bolts, 
um, you're talking about uh, something of the order of 5,000 comparisons, right? If you want to do it numerically. Uh, and uh, it grows as n squared. If you had 1,000, then uh, it would be uh, uh, 1,000 times 1,000, which is a million divided by two. That's uh, 500,000. So that is uh, astronomical in terms of its growth. You don't want to do that, right? Um, obviously, a contrived problem. But uh, n squared, in general, uh, when, when you talk about manual labor, uh, is, 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 is generally not very good. So we'd like to improve this, right? Um, and I, we've been talking about recursion. We've been talking about divide and conquer. Uh, this is not divide and conquer in the true sense, in, uh, in that um, it's, it, it, you're going uh, to a smaller problem, admittedly. But recall, I said divide and conquer is usually used when you break the problem up into um, uh, fractional pieces, okay? Which means in merge sort, for example, um, we took, uh, or the tiling puzzle, uh, we took the courtyard and we broke it up into four courtyards. So essentially we had uh, four quarters in the case of the tiling puzzle. Um, we had two halves in the case of merge sort. Here um, we are solving um, a, a basically one uh, nut and bolt uh, in the original puzzle, and then we're going from n to n minus one, and so there's many more steps, right? Um, the one thing to remember when you think about complexity is that when you go uh, n to n divided by two to n divided by four, and then you keep going and you go all the way down to one, um, this, of course, when you go f like this, there's uh, a linear number of steps. Um, but when you do that, um, how many steps do you have to get all the way to one uh, uh, in relation, uh, if, uh, if you start with n, how many steps do you have? Um, if I had, if this were, this were 64, or, or let's just take um, a simpler one. If this were four, how many steps would I have? I would have two steps. If this were eight, I'd have three steps. And so what's that formula? Logarithm log to the base two, right? So, so that's the power of fractional sizes. And this is actually a very fundamental notion uh, that is going to appear uh, over and over if you do any algorithms work or take any algorithms classes. Um, that uh, divide and conquer uh, is very efficient uh, because the number of steps in order to get down to um, small problems um, is relatively small. It's, it's a logarithm. Now, if you broke this up into, um, uh, in, 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 into three parts and you went to n over three, et cetera, uh, then uh, this would be log to the base something else, in log to the base three. So log to the base two came because we broke it up in, uh, it, uh, it, 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 and we went down to half, half the size. Right? Now, remember, of course, I mean, it's not that the complexity here is just logarithmic. Uh, it's that you do have two problems, um, this is a function of the, the particular specific algorithm that corresponds to divide and conquer. But in the case of merge sort, uh, it's not that we just went from n to n over 2. Well, we went to n, uh, from n to n over 2, but there were two n over 2 size problems. And, uh, but the beauty of, um, um, of divide and conquer is if I magically, if I magically broke up the n size problem, and let's go back to our nuts and bolts, into two problems of size n over 2. So each uh, a problem has n over 2 nuts and n over 2 bolts. OK, each problem has, I'll repeat that, n over 2 nuts and n over 2 bolts. Um, then if I used, uh, uh, and, and this is magical, right? I don't quite know how to do that yet. Uh, but if I did that, uh, then I think about what happens with respect to uh, these comparisons. So I said when n was 100, um, I needed uh, 5,000 comparisons uh, for this uh, naive algorithm. Uh, but now if I did this and I got two n over 2s, then I have 50. So I'll call that m equals 50. And then I have another one, which is m equals 50. And so roughly how many comparisons would I need 
If I had a problem of size 50, 50 nuts and 50 bolts, using our original naive strategy, roughly uh, 1225, right? Roughly, and this would be 1225. And so, so that is 2500. So of course, um, I, 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 don't, I haven't quite told you how to do this. This is still magic, but I was upfront about it. Uh, but clearly, I, I've gotten an improvement if I have this magic, OK? Um, and so let's talk about that. Let's turn this nuts and bolts puzzle, or the solution to this puzzle, and try and figure out a divide and conquer strategy, which is distinctly different from the brute force strategy that just reduced by one. All right. Now, Villa, this was just going on. Um, so the comparisons in the worst case is uh, what I just said, and it grows as n squared. So big O n squared means it just grows as n squared. Right? That's asymptotic notation uh, that we won't go into, but you, get, you understand what that means now. Um, so if I do a, a straightforward divide and conquer, like I did with merge sort, where I just took the array and I split it in half. Right? If I take these nuts and bolts and I take, separate the nuts out you know, put, it, put 50 on this side, 50 on the other side, take the bolts, put 50 on this side, and 50 on the other side. Is that going to work? No, that's not going to work. And uh, it, the reason is, if I do this uh, arbitrary partition, uh, then um, let's say that I take this, and the two of you get together, um, your friends and partners, and you say, let's do this in parallel um, and save some time. You're still going to be counting the number of comparisons. Uh, and so obviously, you also would like to reduce the number of comparisons. But you can't even use a helper here um, in the sense that if you split this up, obviously this was uh, not 50 and 50, but uh, three nuts and three bolts on one side and four and four on the other side. As you can see from this uh, example, um, you uh, had a situation where the matching nut uh, was in one pile on the left um, for a bolt that was on the right-hand side. Right? And that could happen not just for one, which would uh, kill the process, but could happen for many nut-bolt pairs. Right? So we can't do that. Right? We cannot use the straightforward divide and conquer approach. So, so this comes to the first interesting question uh, that we have here, which is uh, how do we exploit the fact that all of you are going to help me? So I'm the disorganized carpenter handyman. and uh, um, I, and, and I'd like to break this up uh, first into two piles such that I can go off and uh, send one or more of you off and, and say, OK, I can guarantee uh, that this is a sub-problem in the sense that the original problem had all of the bolts that matched all of the nuts that were in my pile. I want to break it up into two problems. In s this is the magic that we have. We, we need to figure out this magic, um, that such that if I give you 50 nuts and 50 bolts, and I keep 50 nuts and 50 bolts, uh, that um, you can solve that problem. It is a problem. I mean, it, there's, there's a matching there, right? For those 50 nuts, you have the 50 bolts in your pile. Same thing with me, right? So how do I do that? Right. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Josh. I have a question. Yeah. Can you compare the size of nuts to each other? No, you cannot. Yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, so you, 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 the only uh, thing you can do is you, know, you have, you have a, a, a nut and you have a bolt. And if it goes through, uh, then uh, uh, the, the nut is bigger. Uh, if it doesn't, then the, the bolt is bigger. And then if it fits exactly, you have a match. All right? Uh, great. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, so uh, once you get one to, to fit, you can use that to sort of like, uh, order the other ones. Because it fits in perfectly, right? If it, it fits, so all the ones that you just go through all of them, and if it like goes through just the whole, uh, then you know those are smaller. Oh, well, they're bigger. And then if it doesn't fit through, then you know that those. Right. Are Great. Excellent. So um, Ganatra has uh, discovered this notion of uh, pivoting, and uh, pivoting is essentially something that is best described uh, here in animation. Uh, that gives you a divide and conquer strategy, right? Um, now, 
I answered Joshua's question, and that was a key question, and I'm not going to violate the answer to that question uh, by uh, uh, using some uh, other uh, strategy that, uh, uh, that does not uh, correspond to this uh, nut bolt check, right? So the only thing I can do in this puzzle is a nut bolt check. But I do get three p potential uh, possibilities whenever I do a nut bolt check. I do get the information uh, about a perfect match, whether the nut is smaller or whether the nut is bigger, right? And that's all I need in order to do pivoting, right? Um, and so uh, what's going to happen here is I, I go ahead and uh, I choose an arbitrary bolt. And um, if I, I don't even actually need to find the match uh, before I start this process. So it's a small variant on what Ganatra said, but it's really a pretty small variant. Um, and when I see that uh, this is not a match, and in fact the nut is bigger, then I put the nut on the right-hand side pile. Okay. Um, when I see that uh, the nut is smaller, then I put the nut in the left-hand side pile. And I see a match, I just put that aside. I don't put it in either of the piles. Because I'm going to actually, it turns out I'm not going to get a pile of 50 and 50, or in this case, um, I'm, I'm actually going to get something like uh, uh, three and three because I'm going to get one match out of it, right? So in the case of, in general, I, I, I don't necessarily, uh, I'm not necessarily going to get equal size piles. So that's actually a little bit of uh, an issue, and we'll get back to that uh, maybe later. But uh, I will get a matching, and I'll get uh, a pile on the left that is a perfect problem, perfect subproblem, where I can hand it off to any of you and you can go off and solve it, and it'll work. And I'll get a pile on the right. Same thing for that. Right? So this was a match, but I don't stop. Um, I, I, I don't put the nut in either of the two piles. It's just going to stay up there. And then I keep going. Um, and uh, I, I make up my uh, right pile and my left pile. Right? Now, I'm not quite done yet. What do I do now? Yeah, back there. That's right. So remember, I kept the, I kept the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, I guess you used a different term here. I, uh, you, uh, uh, you, uh, you used, uh, uh, I said bolt, you said screw. That's fine. But we're talking about a nut here. Um, so, so let's go with the nut. And this nut that I put aside, I'm going to now compare that uh, not with this uh, pivot bolt that I picked, uh, which is now set aside and never have to use that again. Um, but I'm going to put that aside, and I'm going to compare um, each of the bolts with this, uh, uh, this pivot nut that I have. So the pivot bolt was picked, and I discover the, the associated pivot nut. And um, I, I, now I'm going to use that pivot nut, which is the, the nut that I have up here. Um, the light green one, and then I'm going to do the same thing. And all of this does not violate the answer to Josh's question, um, and it's going to do exactly the right thing uh, in terms of uh, giving me uh, giving me two piles uh, that uh, are beautiful uh, problems that uh, are going to be solvable. All right. Uh, there's nothing that's stopping me. Uh, from repeating this process. Um, when we talk about divide and conquer, usually we talk about recursion, and we talk about repeatedly doing divide and conquer. Uh, when I wrote this up here in terms of uh, I, the n size problem turned into two n over 2 problems, well, each of those n over 2 problems uh, could turn into two n over 4 problems. So I could have four n over 4s, and so on and so forth. And so I could clearly do that. And especially if n is large, then um, I want to get a reduction in comparisons and uh, get this to grow, by the way. And we won't do this analysis. But rather than growing as n square, um, you'd, you'd like it to grow um, as n log n. Right? And that's kind of uh, the asymptotic analysis uh, that you'll have to do if you take a class like 6006. Uh, but the general sense uh, that uh, 
uh, you should take away from this is that you're going to have a logarithmic number of steps. And obviously, that doesn't imply a logarithmic number of comparisons, because the number of subproblems in each of those steps is doubling. Initially, you had a problem, then you have two subproblems, and then you have four subproblems. Each of them are, are, are small in size. But uh, at, together, um, uh, assuming these problems are, uh, are n over 2 and n over 2, uh, then you can get uh, something that's substantially smaller than n square, namely n log n. Okay? Um, and you can do that numerically. And uh, I don't want to get into that uh, too much, but be happy to talk to you about this um, after lecture or during office hours. Um, there's a couple of uh, caveats. Uh, one of them is uh, there's no guarantee here if I pick um, a random pivot bolt that I'm actually going to get uh, uh, n over 2 and n over 2. Um, it's going to be one less than that. Uh, maybe it'd be n over 2 and n over two, uh, 2 minus 1. I could get something, if I picked a large uh, pivot bolt, I might get a very skewed uh, pair of piles. Right? One of them could have 80 in them, uh, 80 nuts and bolts in them, and the other one could have 20 nuts and bolts in them. Okay? Um, so, so that's something to, to worry about. And uh, we won't worry about that. Uh, uh, but uh, we'll talk about it when we move to sorting, which is what we're going to do in, a, in, a, in just a couple of minutes. Right? So people buy the solution to the nuts and bolts puzzle. Um, clearly, it's going to give you some efficiency. If you pick a middling size a bolt, uh, maybe you can eyeball that. It's a little bit of a violation of what we've talked about. But, uh, uh, but uh, you, you, could, you could clearly, I mean, you, let's assume that, uh, uh, that you can make out the difference between uh, you know, something that's as thick as this and, and a finger. Um, and then you pick something in the middle. Um, and then you can get two large uh, piles that are roughly equal in size from the original really large pile. And uh, at least at the, at the beginning, you could probably get, uh, in the context of this puzzle, uh, piles that are roughly similar in size. Right? And after that, it doesn't really matter once you've broken things up. So n is not 100, but you know, n is more like 5 or 10. At that point, it doesn't really matter what strategy you use, because the numbers aren't very different, um, depending regardless of the strategy. OK? So, so good. All right. So I promised you a relationship to sorting. And obviously, uh, we want to do some programming here. Uh, and it turns out uh, that um, uh, just like we had merge sort, which was a divide and conquer algorithm, um, it turns out this pivoting strategy uh, turns into um, a strategy uh, for divide and conquer that is quite different from merge sort, but is uh, equally applicable to sorting numbers. Okay? And so um, let me remind you what merge sort was. And then I'm going to contrast merge sort with quick sort, uh, which is a pivot-based sorting algorithm. Right? So forget about nuts and bolts. We're now down to uh, uh, boring numbers, uh, integers. And uh, we want to just sort these numbers in ascending order. Okay? So um, if I have a bunch of numbers, and I want to sort these in ascending order, um, merge sort would say, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, break it up uh, into halves. Okay, And let's just do one level of recursion. You know, if with all of these things, you can always do more. But uh, these problems aren't large enough that you really want to do that in this example. And the important thing is, you just broke it into half. You know, but it was easy. The split was easy. You sliced the list, spliced the list, what have you. Right? Um, and uh, you assume that uh, somehow you can sort this in ascending order. And in this case, uh, uh, it, uh, you need to go uh, to that. And then you sort this in ascending order. So you go like that. And then you need to do a merge. And we used what we call the two-finger algorithm to do the merge. That essentially says, I'm, I'm going to uh, assume that this array is sorted and this array is sorted. And I'm going to put um, uh, pointers up um, at the uh, beginning of these two arrays. And I'm going to do comparisons. And I'm essentially going to assume that I have um, an er a blank array um, of size 6, blank list of size 6, 
and I'm going to be writing into this blank array um, the result of the comparison, that is, uh, which one is less in the comparisons. So I'm going to get minus 31, and then I compare 0 with minus 4, and I'm going to get minus 4, 0, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that was our merge. And the important thing to remember is that our merge algorithm uh, was, uh, uh, had an easy divide step, um, and it had a, a more difficult step uh, that corresponded to uh, taking the subarrays that were sorted, and, and the work was all in the merge, okay? putting the things together. Because the divide, obviously, is just like chop. Right? Um, now, at, as you can see from the nuts and bolts, um, division was non-trivial. right? Division required pivoting. Okay? But there was no real merge after that. I mean, the, the, it, once I handed off, let's say, to uh, Ganatra these 50 nuts and bolts after I did the work in pivoting, and I kept 50 nuts and bolts as well, um, we were done. I mean, you just, you just know maybe I want the nuts and bolts back. You know, I don't want to run away with it. Uh, but uh, it wasn't like I had to process anything that uh, he gave me back. Right? If he paired them up, then I didn't have to process that. Right? So um, uh, this is merge sort. Um, the quick sort algorithm, which I'll now describe to you, um, is uh, divide and conquer, uh, two-way divide and conquer, uh, same as merge sort, but it kind of flips the, uh, the work. And it does more work up front before the division. And then there's uh, little or no work at the end. Right? So what happens here is um, the way we're going to think about quick sort is we're going to choose a pivot. We can have some array here. And I can go ahead and just call these A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And I, I'm going to choose a pivot. And in the code that I'm going to show you, we're just going to go ahead and choose the last element. We assume that this is in random order. We're going to choose the last element of this array as the pivot. Right? And uh, what did we do with the pivot back uh, in our nuts and bolts example? We? Someone, what did we do with the pivot? Yeah, go ahead, Ryan. You spliced around it? Yeah, you basically spliced around it. You compared it with, uh, with uh, we took the pivot bolt, and, and in this case uh, of the puzzle, you compared it with the nuts. Here, we don't have nuts and bolts. We just have numbers. And so you're going to take that pivot, and you're going to start comparing it with the other numbers. Um, and uh, you're exactly right in that we're going to get to the point where we have to, uh, to splice around it, which isn't your standard you know, Python uh, splicing because that requires uh, contiguous locations, right? But what you want to do is you want to get to a situation where you have something like this, where you have g somewhere in the middle, and um, all elements less than g are to the left, and let's assume they're all unique elements. Um, all elements greater than g are to the right. Okay, so this is exactly a, 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 a pivoting around g, right? So this is. It's referred to as pivoting um, around G. Okay. Now, um, the nice thing here when you do this um, is that you can go off and um, you can fix the location of G. In fact, G's location, just like the pair, the nut bolt pair, was uh, corresponding to the pivot nut and the pivot bolt was determined during the pivoting step, and you never had to check uh, 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 whether uh, you never had to discover that pair again. You can put that pair aside. Um, the location of G, the pivot chosen, in the final sorted array is determined by this pivoting step. OK? That makes sense? Um, and so, so this location, whatever that index is, you know, it might be uh, right in the middle. It might be a little bit skewed. But that location is determined. And uh, if you did this uh, with roughly equal piles, if you will, or equal uh, sides, if there were 100 elements here, you might see you know, 50 odd here and 40 you know, odd over there. Right? Now, of course, if g happened to be the largest number, uh, then uh, g would be all the way to the right. right? So, so there's that to worry about. Um, and, uh, so, but this is uh, the divide step. So the divide step is the pivoting step. And then you can go off and sort. It's, um, 
each of those uh, sublists, right? Because those less than g are not necessarily uh, in uh, ascending order, right? You just you know, dumped them. There's still work to be done. Um, and then the greater than g, likewise, they're not necessarily in ascending order. But uh, you know that there's uh, 42 elements in corresponding to less than g, and you can go sort that array, and those are going to be the first 42 elements of your final array, right? And the g is going to be um, at the 43rd position, and then the, the ones that are greater than g are going to be to the right of that. Are all make sense? Right? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Fadi. So like, if we were very unlucky, and at, at each step, we just pick the largest element, the largest element, the largest element, and it's going to be n squared, right? That's, that's, that, that's right. So that's pathological. Now, it turns out that, um, amazingly, uh, in order to avoid that situation, when uh, people use quicksort in practice, which is essentially this algorithm that I described, they take the array that they're given, and they actually randomize it. They actually make it, uh, uh, they shake it up. Right? It's, it's like you get these nuts and bolts, and you want to close your eyes, and you want to pick up a nut that's middling in size. And uh, you know, maybe all the small ones are up at the top, and the big ones are down at the bottom. You want things in the middle. Uh, so you go, you shake, 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 you, know, you randomize, and then you go stick your hand in about halfway through the pile and pick, out, pick up a nut or pick up a bolt. Right? That's kind of what happens here. So, so quick sort, it turns out, and I'll just say this, and if this doesn't make sense, um, ask me uh, later, uh, but it should give you some intuition. Uh, uh, the random, randomized quick sort, where you have um, this random input, and uh, you have some probabilistic guarantee that you're picking a pivot that is middling in size, in terms of an integer uh, size, uh, is going to be n log n in complexity. Um, but the worst case complexity of quicksort is exactly as you said, it's n square. Okay? Um, uh, but uh, you know, that's uh, really not something that you need to um, understand deeply to understand uh, well, either the puzzle or the rest of this lecture. Um, you do get a sense of, uh, as long as you have a sense of if you pick something in the middle and these piles are roughly equal in size, I'm going to get some improvement. Right? The guarantee that the piles are roughly equal in size all the way down to the depths of recursion is a difficult one to achieve uh, in a deterministic way. But it's uh, not uh, hard to achieve in a probabilistic way, right? By doing this randomization, right? You had another question? Yeah. yeah. So, like, then why do we use this more than merge sort? We should, like, ah, that's exactly. It. So that is the rest of the lecture, okay? Which is only ten minutes left, but uh, okay. So that's the that's the rest of the lecture, right? So um, uh, one of the things that uh, I said here, I said a blank list of size six, okay? So what merge sort requires, in order for merge sort to be efficient, you needed um, auxiliary storage that corresponded to uh, the size of the list. Because right at the first level of recursion, um, when you got two arrays that were n over 2 and n over 2, and they were both sorted, and you had to, uh, had to merge the two together to create the final result corresponding to the sorted array, uh, you ended up requiring storage that was n in size in order to actually uh, do this two-finger algorithm and compare the minus 31s with the zeros and then write them into this array, right? Now, the obvious way um, of uh, taking this and going to here is code that I'm going to show you uh, that uh, is easy to write, um, and uh, it requires a blank list as well, OK? Uh, you just, I mean, the easy way to do that, and I'll just show you the code because uh, it, it's, it's easier to show you the code um, as opposed to uh, uh, waving my hands here um, and potentially confusing people. Uh, but uh, let me show you first um, the quick sort, divide and conquer, which is uh, absolutely trivial. I mean, just like merge sort was. But um, pivot partition is this step here. Okay, this is the pivoting step. Um, and, and this is uh, what that uh, uh, procedure does, right? So we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but the rest of it is simply, um, I'm going to go ahead, and once I do the pivot part partition, um, I have something that looks like this. And then I just go off and run quicksort on this and quicksort on that. And I'm doing that um, on the array itself. It's, it's just like I have this array. And I'm just saying, uh, I'm going to call quicksort with the indices that are associated with the beginning and the end of this array. And then I'm going to call quick sort with the indices that, are, that begin with the beginning and the end of this array. And as long as, uh, and that same array, 
um, is going to uh, be my final output, right? So everything is done, uh, and the term that's used here is in place, right? So in place sorting and insertion sort, which is also n square, and a few other things are in place sorting algorithms, which essentially say, look, I need to sort all of you, you know, in some uh, some brand, some way, right? You know, perhaps by age or something, and um, I, you know, I don't want to need, I don't want another room, right? I don't want to say, oh, who's the youngest here, and then go over to that room, and then you know, who's the next youngest, and go over to the room, etc. I just want you to start swapping positions here, and we're all going to be in this room, and somehow, you know, we're going to get sorted, right? So that's in place. And when I have an, uh, an array that corresponds to uh, integers, I don't want another blank list or blank array and uh, use that storage. And so that answers your question at the top level as to why quicksort is used. And it's used because the memory requirements of quicksort are substantially less than the memory requirements of merge sort. And in fact, you can do this uh, a pivoting step using um, one integer uh, as storage. You need the original array, of course, but you needed that to store all of the numbers. And the auxiliary storage, the extra storage that you need, is exactly the storage for one integer where you store the pivot. Okay? And I'm going to show you the na naive way, which is the uh, regular quicksort. And, and that is a, a, a trivial uh, pivot partition. It's not the clever one, which essentially says, look, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new array. And I, 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 or in fact, I have uh, two arrays that are less and more, or two lists. Together, the sizes of less and more are going to be the size of the original, right? Maybe minus one. But I'm adding to less and adding to more, depending on whether the element is less than the pivot or greater than the pivot. And then uh, I, I'm good. So there's, the, that, there's that algorithm, which would just be, oh, yeah, I'm going to create a new um, a list here, and I'm going to compare A to G. And, uh, and then I'm going to compare uh, you know, B to G, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So this does not give you anything. This is an uninteresting algorithm. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, th uh, implementation. This is an uninteresting implementation. Okay? Um, it is much more, um, it's, it, you need to be much more clever, I don't need this anymore, um, to do this in place. Okay? So what I want to do, um, is I'm going to take an example here. Um, I want uh, I wanted to be able to take this array and I'm going to not talk about the recursive sorting or anything like that because that's easy, right? We kind of know how to do that. What I want to do is I want to choose this as the pivot. And I want to translate that somehow um, into the final uh, uh, pivoted uh, uh, output, which is going to be 0, minus 31, 1, 2, um, 65. 99, whoops, oh, so I have, I have something wrong here. So this should be the other way around, 83, right? OK, ooh, bug. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, this is fine, this is fine. I just need it, to, I don't need it to be sorted. OK, good, whew, all right, I, I had this, uh, I, I just thought I found the first bug in my book. OK, so um, there's probably many bugs in the book, but I don't want to know. Don't. Right, so um, I don't need this to be sorted. Yeah, so it's a 0, a minus 31. So the key is that I've discovered this, and everything to the left of that is less than 1, and everything to the right of that is greater than 1, and that's the only requirement that I have. And, and as I said, I mean, I said this to begin with, and then I forgot. I said, we're not going to worry about the recursion. So clearly, I have to do more work here um, with, uh, with respect to um, uh, taking this uh, set of numbers and, and sorting them in ascending order, et cetera. But what I've done here is I know that 1 is fixed in place, and 1 will never move. right? And I, I just do have to, do, I have to turn this into minus 31 and 0, 
and I have to do some reordering here, but one is fixed in place. Okay. Now, the algorithm that, I have, that I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the code, and it's probably code uh, that uh, I, you won't be able to uh, parse, uh, at least in, uh, in minutes uh, or seconds. Uh, and this code is in place pivoting. Okay? It's uh, clever code. Um, and what it does is it has uh, one additional variable worth of storage that we're going to call uh, the, the, uh, the pivot. Right? So that you see the variable pivot there. And um, just using that one additional integer storage, it manages to transform this array uh, using a linear number of steps into, into this array. All right? So you can see that this is non-trivial. Right? I, I, I need to move from here to there without having this extra storage. If you had extra storage, it would be easy. We know how to do that. But if you didn't, you, have, you need this, this code that has uh, an outer while loop. You see while not done. And then it's got two inner while loops in it. And it's got a couple of counters, a couple of uh, pointers, I should say, to indices. And you go left and right, and uh, you uh, magically get uh, this answer. Right? But there's no magic here, because we uh, have the code up, and we can run it. And uh, computers aren't smart. So clearly, uh, that, that code is doing something clever, and we just need to understand that. All right? So I'm going to, in the couple of minutes I have left, uh, this is the last thing I want to do, is I want to tell you how this code works. OK? And it's really pretty code. Uh, and it's, it's clever code. So what I have is um, I have two um, uh, 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 pointers, top and bottom. So I'm going to essentially say that top is all, uh, bottom is 0. Um, it initially is minus 1, but we go ahead and increment it. And top is 8. right? And so um, uh, how many? Uh, I have uh, uh, 9, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, so, uh, so, t so top is pointing to the pivot. So this is, this is pointing to the pivot, which is top is 8. And, and bottom is pointing to, um, uh, to the first element. Right? So um, these two while loops are essentially going from the left of the array uh, and going uh, uh, this way from the, from the right of the array. So um, uh, uh, what we're going to do, and, I, and don't worry about exactly how the code does this. I'm going to show you the way this array is transformed and the way this, these um, pointers are, are changed. And then you'll get a sense of uh, how this code works. Right? And uh, obviously, this transformation happens in one of those while loops. All right? So um, uh, we have the pivot corresponding to 1, and bottom equals 0, and top equals 8. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start moving um, uh, leftward uh, from uh, uh, this would be the second inner while loop. I'm going to start moving. Um, uh, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to start. I'll, I'll start with, uh, with, uh, with bottom. I'm going to increment. Bottom is initially minus 1. I increment it to 0. Um, and um, I start moving rightward from uh, the left of the list and try and find an element that is greater than 1. Right? And that is uh, immediate. I realize that 4 is greater than 1. Okay. So when I realize that 4 is greater than 1, I'm going to copy over 4. And this is, doesn't mean that I'm copying the entire array. I'm just going to copy over 4, but I'm writing what the array looks like, because that's important, over to here. right? And you might say, uh, pivot equals 1. You might say, oh, but I overwrote the location 1. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Um, I do have 1 stored in my pivot, so my, my pivot has uh, 1 in it. Okay, So I haven't lost anything here. It's not like I threw away any locations. I do have that extra location. Right? So I did this rightward move um, going from the left. Now I'm going to go uh, leftward uh, from, the, uh, from, the, uh, from the right. And uh, I'm going to look for something that is less than 1. And I'm going to try and move it. So basically, what this algorithm does is it, it uh, tries to find 
things that are, uh, if A is, uh, um, is greater than G, it, it moves A to the rightmost part of the array. If, um, uh, if, 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 uh, and the same thing, if D is less than G, then it moves it to the, uh, to the left part of the array. So depending on uh, whether uh, the comparison to G is greater or less, you want to end up in the edges of the array. And you're going to try and get the edges of the array to be correct uh, in, the, in the sense that they have elements on the left that are less than the pivot and the elements on the right that are greater than the pivot. And you try and uh, get to the middle. And when, you, when your two pointers converge, your top and bottom pointers converge, you are done. All right. So let's do a couple more steps and, um, and, uh, and, and close this lecture. So um, I did uh, uh, the right step. Now I'm going, um, going rightward. And now I'm going to go leftward. Um, what is the first element that is um, um, less than 1? Uh, no, less than 1. It's 0. Right? Yes, but I'm going this way. Yeah, I, I'm going. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm glad you uh, pointed that out. I needed to make sure. So I went, I went uh, rightward the first time, and I want to go leftward this time. So, so this would be. So I, I come here, and I see, I see zero. When I see zero, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to transform the array. I'll write this out to make sure I get this right, and. Uh, So right now I have 4, 65, 2, minus 31, 0, uh, et cetera. And um, I'm going to go uh, this way. And I'm going to put, when I see the 0, I'm going to copy over 0 over here and leave the 0 in here for a second. And there's no problem here because 4 was copied over here. And so now I overwrote 4 with 0. OK, now you kind of see, maybe get a, some sense of how this algorithm works. This is the first um, uh, interesting step where I took 0. And because 0 is less than 1, as I mentioned, I want to jam it all the way to the left. OK, just put it all the way to the left. And I'm cool with uh, uh, losing 4 because 4 is being put all the way to the right. OK, now at this point, my uh, bottom and top uh, are going to get modified. Um, my um, bottom is still 0, but the top is 4. Because I moved, top was 8, and I decremented a top all the way to the point where it became 4, and I realized that 0 was less than 1. And then um, I copied over uh, that value over to the, to the bottom. You can kind of see the code up there. Um, uh, it, 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 this is actually an output of that code. And I put, I put a 0 in here. So that's what my counters look like. And it's only a couple more steps. Um, we're going to go now go right. And I'm going to go do this again, uh, except that uh, uh, 0 is already taken care of. So now I see 65. Um, clearly, um, I'm going to have a situation where um, it, it's, uh, if I go this way, 65 is, is greater than the pivot. right? So I'm going to go 0, 65, 2, um, minus 31. And because 65 is greater than the pivot, I'm going to write it into uh, what the top was, which obviously got copied over that way. So I'm going to have 65 in here, 99, 83, 782, and 4. Right? So now, um, after this step, bottom equals 1. And the reason for that was 65 was in the location um, 1, and top equals um, 4. And then the next one, someone want to tell me what the, the, the next one is going to be? If I go leftward, I'm going to start from here. Top was 4. So I was pointing at uh, 65. Um, and I'm looking for, um, uh, looking for something that uh, um, uh, it, it, when, I go, when I go this way, um, I saw 65 greater than 1. Now I'm looking for something that is less than 1. And minus 31 is less than 1, correct? When I go this way, I'm looking for something that's less than. So, so given that it's minus 31, I'm going to copy over minus 31 to what top was pointing to. So I have minus 31, 2, minus 31, 65, 99, 83, 782, and 4. And at this point, 
I'm going to have bottom equals 1 and top equals 3. Um, keep going. One more. Um, and um, I get to the point where I see 2. 2 is greater than 1. 0 and minus 31 are less than 1. And so I take 2 and I copy, over, copy it over here. Right? And now at this point, when I do an in increment, I realize that top, uh, bottom is 2 and top is 3. And in the very next step, bottom will equal top. And I'm sitting up here. Um, uh, and so I copy, I make 2. I write the pivot into the location um, that corresponds to um, the uh, bottom uh, after top got decremented. Um, and in that case, both bottom and top are 2. And that index, 0, 1, and 2, the pivot gets written into it. And so that's exactly what I had, which I wrote right at the beginning. All right. So um, uh, I would say this is probably the most uh, complicated code from a control flow standpoint that I've ever shown you. This, uh, th this algorithm is an um, in-place algorithm that does not require any extra storage. And uh, that's exactly why it's so popular. People are sorting billions of elements uh, in lists, and you can't use gigabytes of storage during the sorting process. Right? And what this clever strategy tells you is you don't need all of that storage. You can do things in place. And as long as you choose the pivot reasonably well, you get your average case n log n complexity, which is the same as the worst case complexity of merge sort. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. 